Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really happy that all of you arrived. I personally went, uh, I was walking from our institute and in this really hot weather, uh, I was wondering how many people would arrive. So I'm really happy that you are all here, including all our guests. So let me, uh, allow me to officially open uh, our conference entitled Russia in Motion, Ambition, Capabilities and the Search for Identity. As you have probably noticed, the topic is uh, very broad, but we would like to focus on what is happening in Russia this time, not around Russia, as is usually the focus of conferences like this. So our question is, where is Russia moving? This motion leads somewhere, but we are at a loss to some extent uh, in terms of where uh, uh, Russia is, is heading. And I think that this is related to two big conundrums, big, two big puzzles that we would like to at least partially solve here during the conference. The first big puzzle is what political scientists call rationality puzzle. And that is the big question whether the actions taken by political leaders, and now of course I'm talking about President Putin, are part and parcel of long-term, rational, um, well-crafted strategy, or whether these actions are rather a response to current <coughs> issues, maybe emotional, maybe identity politics, as might be the case in, in uh, the post-Soviet space. So this is the first big question is, are we talking about rational actions by the current Russian leadership or are we talking about other factors behind these actions? And the second big question is of course uh, what is called the primacy puzzle and the question what plays the primary role as a motivator for foreign policy and domestic politics as well? Is it economy? stupid, as, as one of the American presidents uh, famously put it, uh, or is the motivation originally politically, political and of course only the de derived effects are economic. And the same of course applies to the Ukrainian crisis, the same applies to uh, Russian actions in other countries around, around Russia. Are the drivers political or economic? That will be the second question. The usual approach to answering these two questions is to start by uh, looking at the sequence of actions the two or more actors in the international arena take, action and reaction, but our approach is somewhat different. We would like to start by focusing on uh, Russian domestic politics, on the domestic determinants, because of course uh, and I'm uh, curious about what we will hear from our speakers here. Uh, many of the motivating factors are domestic, and especially in countries uh, that are great powers, that are more focused on what is happening domestically and how that is connected to, to international affairs. So I uh, hope that we will be able to answer these <coughs> questions, as, as I said at least partially, uh, but I'm quite confident in that respect because we have succeeded in uh, gathering a very prominent group of uh, uh, personalities of Russian as well as Czech experts. Uh, our conference will have two parts. In the morning panel we will focus on the presentations by our Russian guests and uh, the related uh, 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 replies to, to those. Um, but before I will introduce our guests here, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Foreign Ministry as uh, one of the two main organizers together with our institute for their continuous support, uh, both in uh, terms of the conference uh, venue, this beautiful mirror hall of the uh, ministry building, but also in terms of of financial and personal support for uh, for Riach, for which we are uh, really grateful. In particular, I would like to thank uh, those people from the department of Director Zhigova, uh, who were very active in in helping us to uh, to organize this conference. 
So before I come to the substance and to introducing the speakers, I would like to pass the floor to the director, Alice Kajigova. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to apologize to Director General Mr. Shamek. I see that he has his place over there, but um, he had some important meeting, but you met him yesterday, so um, just uh, join us later, I hope. Uh, thank you very much. I am really honored to welcome you all here on behalf of Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Chenin Palace um, at the conference uh, Russia in Motion, Ambitions, Capab Capabilities and the Search for Identity. I think even the, the title is very ambitious, so uh, I hope we will, we will uh, witness a very interesting, open and inspiring discussion. There is no doubt that Russia has been a very important topic uh, for the uh, Czech uh, foreign policy and uh, we have been dealing with uh, different aspects of our relation with Russian Federation, uh, multilateral and bilateral, uh, but uh, this time we have decided to look at this uh, question from a different point. Uh, through the discussion open and I would like to underline independent discussion uh, of the uh, very, uh, very famous and very well uh, chosen guest experts in international relations, uh, in experts in economic, journalists, intellectuals uh, and I think we have really a uh, very a special occasion to, to share and to hear uh, what's going on, uh, what challenges, which, which kind of challenges and developments the uh, Russian Federation is undergoing today. Um, it's really unique to hear from insiders, now I mean the specialists from Russia, and again I would like to, to mention again that these voices are Special specialists, but independent ones. So I think this will be very inspiring for all of us uh, to have this different point that usual uh, foreign foreign policy is uh, has has to follow. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, you all once again. Thank you for being with us, and also I will use the occasion to express our gratitude to the Institute for Internal Relations um, for organizing uh, um, this event with us, which we consider a very, very important one. Um, so, I will take our time, which I think will be um, much more um, and, well, uh, use, much, much better use for discussion. And I wish you Fruitful and interesting debates and very interesting day. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Director Gigova, for, for the kind words, for the introduction. And with that, I think we can pass directly to our five speakers in the first, in the first panel. Let me first introduce them very briefly because all of them are active in so many uh, different uh, media outlets or analytical institutions that uh, we would spend too much time naming them all, but just starting uh, with, on my right with uh, Natalia Zubarevich, uh, who is the director of the regional program uh, of the Independent Institute for, for Social Policy and also professor at Moscow State, uh, State University, uh, also an expert at the UN Development Program and uh, Moscow representative of the International Labour Organization. And Natalia will be focusing uh, both in the morning and in the afternoon on the uh, economic aspects of, you know, of the current uh, Russian situation. Then farther on my right, um, Nikolai Petrov, uh, who is professor at Higher School um, of Economics in Moscow, uh, who also worked for a long time for uh, the Carnegie Moscow Center and who is also a columnist at uh, Moscow Times which is one of the 
one, one of the high quality English language uh, um, uh, Russia based uh, newspapers, which I highly recommend, by the way. Um, um, uh, third, uh, Alexander Morozov, uh, uh, a journalist, a political scientist, uh, and a blogger as well, um, who is currently uh, editor in chief of the uh, Russian journal magazine. Uh, russs.ru uh, also uh, published in many other outlets including Gazeta, Slon uh, and so on. Uh, on my left uh, Boris Grozowski uh, who also works for works or has worked for, for a number of, of media outlets including uh, Forbes or Viedomosti uh, uh, again a famous famous uh, newspaper. And finally, Konstantin von Egert, uh, the former editor-in-chief of the BBC um, Russian service uh, in uh, the Moscow office, also a diplomatic correspondent uh, in the 1990s, uh, member of the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm really happy that, as, as you can see, uh, the group of people are really a group of distinguished scholars, uh, and I'm really looking forward to our debate uh, today. So um, let us, I'm sorry, let us start in the, in the order um, as uh, speakers are in the program. So let's start with Konstantin. No one was prepared 
for the end of the Soviet Union. But I think that there is another qualification that, well, that has to be made. Uh, let's face it, apart from the Bolts, a few Western Ukrainians, a few Georgians, very few people wanted the Soviet Union to collapse. And the fact that the collapse of the state came within essentially two years, I would count, from early 1989, the first semi-free elections to the Congress of People's Deputies, to the 25th of December, when the Soviet flag was hauled down from the Kremlin. Uh, this is nothing in terms of history. And I think that this remains largely unexplained to the Russian society. The Russian society, in this respect, I would compare uh, to what uh, famous historian and philosopher Alexander Yanov called Weimar Russia, i.e. a country which, uh, and actually he did it in mid-90s, that is an interesting thing, um, that is a country that, uh, or a society that is gripped by belief that it was let down, gripped by um, uh, this desire to play back history because what happened in 1991 was not wished for by the Russians, let's face it. And uh, because it happened so quickly, uh, people tend to think that it was a result of some kind of sinister conspiracy by Gorbachev, by the United States, World Freemasonry, <coughs> CIA, you name it, but it was not us who lost the country. And I think that this pervasive mentality in which we have nothing to do with that, we have nothing to, bl to blame for, um, we are just spectators in this drama which other people play out for us. Uh, it's a very dangerous state of mind because, first of all, it incapacitates any growth of civil society because the idea that you're not responsible for anything actually is not very conducive to civic activism. And secondly, it unfortunately, the state of psychology, national psychology, lends itself very easily uh, to the kind of um, other we call it demagoguery that's being used now by the Russian ruling class. Um, and I think that from this point of view, it's also another thing, second thing that's probably important to understand, is that because of the state of affairs, all Russian policy essentially is domestic. Ukraine is a domestic issue for Russia. NATO is a domestic issue. Believe me, Putin knows that Czech tanks do not intend to roll into Smolensk, or Polish tanks for that matter. Um, in the absence of civic society, in the absence of clear-cut goals of advancing somewhere, <coughs> as you did in the 90s and early 2000s towards the EU and NATO, I do not necessarily mean that Russia should advance towards these goals, but I mean at least some goals. In the absence of this, um, first of all, it's very easy for the society to look back. And secondly, it is very easy for the political class to turn national interests into the interests of the ruling class, of the elites. In this respect, Russian domestic policy is all about helping Mr. Putin and his team to stay in power as long as they will wish. And in this respect, foreign policy is about external protection of their capability, of their ability to stay in power as long as they wish. Hence, I'm not denying that Russia has objective national interests. Uh, for example, we do not want nuclear war. We generally prefer to be rich and healthy <coughs> to being poor and sick. But apart from these generalities, there are not many interests that are realized by the society as truly national interests, truly springing from the uh, from the basics of national life. Um, I think that this creates a situation in which um, absolutely blatant, <laughs> if I may call it so, experimentation with the judicial process, with elections, with uh, the media, uh, are very much uh, 
um, at the fingertips of the regime in Russia. Um, it not only uses the confused state of mind of the Russian nation, but it abuses it by um, actually conserving this state of mind. Uh, I know it's not a, it's not uh, the topic is not Russian foreign policy, uh, but let me use the U word, Ukraine, to briefly uh, describe how I see the significance of that domestically. Um, it is widely accepted, and I think is actually true, uh, that the two most important events in Russian domestic or internal uh, politics of the last 15 years did not happen in Russia proper. They both happened in Kiev, Maidan 1 and Maidan 2. And the abiding fear of the Kremlin is that Maidan 3 will happen in Moscow. And to this end, uh, all the resources of the propaganda machine, uh, all the resources of the security services, all the resources of the state economy are turned towards fulfilling the goal of not letting it happen. Um, I think that what we see in this respect is a situation which happened quite a few times over the last 15 years. We see tactical interests of the political class, i.e. Again, well, probably actually strategic interests of the political class, uh, i.e. staying in power for as long as they want, leading to technical steps like taking over the Crimea, which lead to strategic defeats. Because after what happened in the Crimea, Ukraine in the foreseeable future, a couple of generations at least, will be, well, probably not anti-Russian, but definitely anti-Kremlin, pro-EU and pro-NATO. So what was achieved is exactly the opposite of what Mr. Putin and his team have declared they wanted. Um, I think that at the core of both Russian foreign and domestic policy is the issue of legitimacy. And here again, I'd like to touch upon recent events. Um, I'm going to be a bit more provocative than probably needs to be, but I'm just trying to highlight that. I would claim that uh, the takeover, the annexation of the Crimea had pretty much nothing to do with NATO enlargement, Sevastopol base, or anything that even remotely touches upon uh, what could be called external hard security. Um, I see it as a purely domestic step designed to strengthen, solidify, and probably actually make it unassailable uh, the position of President Putin personally and his immediate entourage as people who do good, <coughs> as people who deliver miracles. I think that, although probably uh, this was to a large extent a decision taken probably within a month or two before or preparation for it started, but probably about two months before the actual annexation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that the uh, underlying current that led to that existed before. That is using the post-Soviet, post-imperial inferiority complexes for the benefit of the Kremlin. You suffered because you thought that the Crimea was unjustly separated from Russia in 1954, and you thought you lost it completely in 1991 when Ukraine became independent. Look what up. We deliver it to your doorstep. You are strong again. You can be proud. In the absence of um, civil society institutions, in the absence of the possibility to realize oneself, in business, because not everyone is an oligarch and running a business and meeting a small business in Russia is a very difficult endeavor, as I'm pretty sure Boris will tell. In the absence of the education system that kind of produces forward-looking innovative people, 
In the absence of the courts he could believe in, in the absence of police he could trust, in the absence of real elections, what is left is the imperial pride, and Putin is using it to the full. So, what I would say, domestically, what happened in uh, March this year, is a very significant event. I think, I, I, I propose to think, that it has probably changed the nature of legitimacy of the Russian political regime. From what was supposed to be a presidential republic, where the president is elected once in six years. Okay, we know there are not really elections, and we know that the problems that the uh, Putin system experienced over the last 10 years was in trying to combine two uncombinable things, legitimizing an increasingly undemocratic system by democratic means. We know it all. But for the sake of stability, people were prepared to play a charade and pretend they are electing someone and pretend they vote for Mr. Prokhorov as an opposition, knowing full well what the result is going to be. And we all thought that Mr. Putin is moving towards 2018 as the president of stability and gradually, probably even slow, but still growth in living standards. Someone who will maintain the status quo, the boring guy. What happened in the Crimea changed that. Now, although the head of state is still essentially called a president, he's not really a president in spirit. The Crimea is a purely imperial adventure, something in the spirit of Peter the Great, Catherine the Great. Uh, it's something straight out of the 19th century. It is essentially the monarch producing miracles for the people. It's a magician pulling rabbits out of the top hat. Hence the ratings. Okay, you cannot really believe Russian sociology and think that if they say it's 83%, it's really 83%, but it's very clear that Putin's popularity has risen to unprecedented heights. I think the biggest question is how long will it last and what will happen when eventually, after half a year or a year, this popularity will, by default, go down because people cannot be euphoric about the Crimea forever. What other rabbits are there in the Kremlin's top hat to pull out? Because this intoxication with success, this very high plank that's been set by the Kremlin, is actually a very dangerous political development for the Kremlin itself. Once you cease to deliver on these miracles, mm, you're in big trouble. It's very difficult to go back from invading the Crimea to just saying, well, you know, mm, I'm going to maintain your pensions at the current level. It doesn't really fit. You could say that the absence of opposition is something that helps to legitimize the regime. Yes, I think that Mr. Putin has spent the last 15 years eradicating any possibility for the real opposition to appear, cultivating uh, a national mind in which politics is a dirty word, and an even dirtier word is a T word, democracy. Uh, and now, it's very funny when you come to conferences like this in more sort of probably wider context, the Brussels forums and the RICA conferences of this world, and someone necessarily stands up, or probably quite a few people, and say, well, no, there is really no alternative to Putin. Of course there isn't. Because he's made it his point, like his aim of not letting any opposition appear. This is another dangerous development. Because essentially, uh, <coughs> The government is trying to, or is living, um, in a hall of mirrors where wherever they go, they only see themselves. This trend, and what we see today, I think is a very logical development of what happened two years ago when Mr. Putin came back uh, from the Russian White House to the Kremlin. And this legitimacy issue. Everything that was done in the last two years is not for nothing. It's a consequence of a very deep, deep trauma that Russia's regime suffered in 2011 and early 2012 
during the Moscow protests. Um, it has led to re-evaluation, don't have the time to probably go in depth into that, but it led to the re-evaluation of what should be the proper attitude to society and proper internal domestic policy making. Until 2012, and especially in the first two terms of Mr. Putin, well, and also Mr. Medvedev, the perception was that the president is a kind of president for all. Um, if you remember the last, um, the last uh, scene from Milos Forman's Amadeus, when uh, six Salieri is being carted through the, uh, through the uh, psychiatric uh, hospital, and says, make the is of the world, I absorb you all. So this kind of attitude, you know, oh yeah, we know you voted against me, you pesky intelligentsia, you intellectuals, you students, but I'm your president. I'm delivering on, uh, on prosperity. I'm, your living standards are growing, and I know that eventually you will ha thank me for that. And you don't need democracy as long as you can buy new plasma TV tomorrow. The protests led to a situation in which the intelligentsia the active part of the society, whatever you call it, is, is seen now as traitors, as ungrateful people who did not look up to the Kremlin for letting them buy another plasma television and demanding something that is really strange, honest elections, uh, competition, transparency. No way. So, and this is the third point I'd like to make that is very important. Two years ago, a co I think a pretty conscientious decision was taken to stop this policy of pretending that this political regime is the regime of all Russians, as it was, especially during Putin's first two terms, as I said. Now, there are two types of Russians. The good Russians, mostly living in the provinces, not learning foreign languages, distrustful of America, loving whoever is in the Kremlin by virtue of him just or her, just sitting in the Kremlin to be politically correct. And this is the majority. The good Russian people who love their Tsar. And there's a bad Russian people. Well, they do carry Russian passports, what can they do about it? Modern democracy, but, uh, but, but they are not really our people. And Mr. Putin's uh, naming of anyone who opposes his policy as a national traitor and fifth colonist and whatever else is very significant. It is the real worldview from the top of the Kremlin Towers. Those who are not with us are against us and we only let them exist at our own pleasure, at our own magnanimity. Otherwise these people have nothing to do with the real Russia, which is united as one. The Crimea, I think, led to exacerbation, to the pinnacle, to the peak of these attitudes. And they are going to um, influence um, Russian domestic policy for years to come. Uh, and I think that the unpleasant things, actually unpleasant for all of us, not only for the Kremlin, are still ahead. When realities of economic stagnation, realities of Russia's relative economic weakness in a, in a global economy, realities of bad governance will start to undermine everyday life. Then it will be a very problematic thing for the Kremlin to prove that it still has legitimacy. Because, and I think that's what the last 25 years taught us, you cannot really rely on the gratitude of the people. People have forgotten people in five years about the Soviet empty shells and started blaming Chubais, Gaidar and the rest of them for privatization. Now they forgot privatization, now they're thinking about something else. The Crimea will also be forgotten eventually. People and it's completely normal, I think basically they are looking at their day-to-day -day interests eventually. And the task of providing for that becomes increasingly difficult, as I think Natalia and Boris will tell you uh, from the sociological and the economic point of view. What 
what I would like to conclude with is this probably slightly paradoxical thought. The events of the last months seemingly have consolidated uh, the Kremlin's hold on Russia to unprecedented extent. But I also think that because of the things I mentioned, they potentially have created more instability and more unpredictability, both domestically and externally. Because on the one hand, the Kremlin has to consolidate its power and keep the high ratings. On the other hand, what else can be done? On the other hand, you have sanctions who are weak, but they have a long-term psychological effect undermining trust in what Moscow says. You have the economy that is, well, dependent on uh, the outside world and uh, now, for example, credit for Russian companies, especially short-term credit, has become more expensive and more difficult to get. There are small things that chip away at this monolith, which seemingly is there. And the problem is that no one, neither the Kremlin nor the opposition, know what will happen when the crisis, I don't know, prodded by external events, for example, a strong U.S. administration that will take up Ukraine's cause, or by domestic issues like economic mismanagement. No one knows what will be the consequences of that. No one knows how the system will react, probably with more repression. But I think the problem is that repression is also finite in Russia. You can't rule like Stalin and live like Abramovich, as Boris Nemtsov once said. I think these contradictions form a very, a very unsettling perspective for Russia. Very unstable, very foggy. I'd say I don't know what's going to happen in 2016 and 2018 during the Duma elections and the presidential elections. <laughs> Actually, it was much clearer what happened before, what would have happened before the Crimea and now. Exactly because of issues of legitimacy and um, a very high plank of support that the government wants to maintain. So, the future is uncertain. To me, Russia is less stable today than it was half a year ago. And the strategic environment starts to matter more for Russia than it used to be uh, even six months ago with a reinvigorated NATO, the EU in search of an alternative energy policy, and Ukraine being in turmoil. It's going to be probably an exciting few years, but unpredictable few years, and probably very unsettling few years, both for the Kremlin and for those who oppose him, because uh, actually no one can chart any kind of meaningful course in this circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Konstantin, very much for the um, uh, thought-provoking contribution. One idea which I think is extremely important is this historical analogy, because we know that many historical analogies are flying around, and you mentioned uh, the Russia in the 1990s as a kind of Weimar Germany analogy, and of course this begs the question, because historically we would have a sequence of weak democracy followed by strong autocracy, and the question is, what do we have in Russia today? Is it a strong autocracy? in a nascent autocracy, or is it a weak one? And that's, that's I think, the, the tricky question, which is related to the question of legitimacy, as you rightly pointed out. And, and indeed, there are just two options, just two options, either buying people well, by increased welfare, or by what you call uh, white rabbits, external white rabbits. And then the question uh, would be, who is the next white rabbit then? Uh, which I think we will discuss in, 
in the, in the debate afterward. But I would like to turn to this first type of legitimation strategy, and that's the domestic economy-based legitimization. And with that, I would ask uh, Boris to, to give us his views on, on, on the issue. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, because of my English is not so, so fluent as I want, uh, um, I should uh, use uh, uh, for this presentation the English text uh, which I wrote yesterday. Uh, uh, but primarily, uh, uh, the main sphere of uh, my interest is uh, economic policy, matter, and uh, behavior of the uh, economy especially in, in its application to the uh, decisions which, uh, which are made by uh, government officials, firms and uh, households. Uh, that uh, they don't want to rise, push 
pension, uh, pension age, which in Russia is very, very low, uh, 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 the government will, will not uh, rise the pension age. Uh, what do uh, what do think about these uh, economists in the government and economists outside uh, the government? Uh, uh, this doesn't matter. Only, only question is uh, how how do people react? Uh, uh, do they uh, do they uh, approve uh, approve the action or uh, assume uh, it as a wrong do? And this is only question which uh, which Kremlin uh, care for. Uh, because of that, uh, uh, is uh, is the rating of Putin go up?
is not only TV propaganda. Now it is the way of how people are thinking in Russia, including uh, including the, the guys uh, from, the, from the government. Uh, it works almost like a Stalin propaganda. In the uh, 1930s, uh, the society in common uh, uh, Citing common belief that uh, there are many enemies of the people in Russia and there are a lot of uh, pests who spoiled the industry and in, industrial technologies and brought the industry production down. And uh, Stalin uh, can destroy this, uh, this guys. Uh, fifth, uh, Putin is ready to any actions which uh, he needs to stay in the power. He is ready to become outlaw in the world leaders uh, community. Principally, he is ready to bring Russia uh, uh, in the autarky. Uh, uh, the European Union and uh, the US has, um, in this context, only two ways to uh, influence to Russia. First uh, is uh, Embargo to uh, rational gas metals and uh, and so on. Uh, second is to uh, uh, prohibit the loans to Russian firms, the loans from uh, from uh, from the West, from the uh, US and Europe, to uh, uh, to prohibit the loans to the Russian firms like Gazprom, Rosneft, Sberbank, VTB, and, and so on. This is the uh, and I think uh, <clears throat> uh, this threat uh, was, was uh, the main reason uh, of uh, why Putin decided not to have uh, Donetsk and Lugansk in, in Russia. Uh, uh, six and uh, the last uh, phases is about uh, citizens. Uh, the uh, USSR was a very uh, collectivistic country, uh, uh, society. Uh, the level of trust, the trust, uh, the social capital were um, in UGS society at the very high levels. When USSR uh, collapsed, uh, the high level of trust uh, was collapsed, uh, was, uh, collapsed uh, with uh, it. In uh, 1990, Russia was a very atomized society in which every person uh, was uh, taking care about uh, themselves but not about uh, others, not about poor, oldest, not uh, um, about ecology and so on. The uh, uh, civic organization, the third uh, sector in that time, in uh, 19th, uh, was very weak. Uh, very weak in Russia. The violence of uh, personal prosperity uh, was much more stronger than the uh, altruistic violence. Uh, now, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the situation uh, get to the better in the last four or six years, but um, it, uh, it get to the better very, very Slowly, uh, uh, because of uh, because of uh, this very low level of trust, very low um, uh, uh, social capital, Russians now couldn't live in the democracy. Uh, 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 because of that, Russian uh, uh, now have um, um, uh, very low um, economic growth. Uh, there are more security guards, 
especially I think what is important is to always bear in mind that the current uh, popularity of President Putin is not only a reaction to the Crimea crisis but to the 1990s as well. The arrival of the uh, radical individualization of the society, wild capitalism of the 1990s, of all these are things that are in the public mood still perceived as, as, as a disastrous start for, for most Russians. And of course then the collectivist, collectivistic or even corporativist elements in the Russian uh, political thinking, of course, are a reaction to, to, to this, uh, to this uh, dark period for, for, for many. Um, Nikolai, um, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to address uh, those points which are included into our agenda and uh, uh, I will start with saying that uh, I do not have any good news <laughs> about uh, where Russia is going, uh, unlike in past, by the way. And uh, uh, in short, I would answer that Russia is going in direction of full size of authoritarianism with certain elements of totalitarian state. Uh, and in my view, confrontation with the West uh, was inevitable and uh, it came not in result of uh, Ukrainian crisis, it could uh, take uh, another shape, but its logical phase of the Russian uh, political regime uh, development. And when uh, being faced uh, by the problem uh, whether uh, to make the country more uh, open and promote uh, competition and thus to promote economic development or to keep uh, it uh, closed in order to keep uh, in power at the expense of the economic development Putin's uh, oligarchic regime decided uh, has preferred uh, the second uh, option and uh, I think what is important now is that those uh, moves which uh, have been made by uh, Russian leadership last month uh, are very different from what was going on in recent past in terms of uh, the uh, multidimensional choice uh, which was made and which is leading country uh, inevitably to uh, very uh, serious, uh, well, and negative uh, direction. And I would uh, explain this choice as a multidimensional one. And uh, there used to be uh, several, uh, several dimensions which I'll try to mention. First, it was the choice between uh, liberal uh, economy and uh, uh, mobilization type economy and it was made in favor of mobilization type. It was the choice between hybrid regime and uh, authoritarian regime and it was made in favor of authoritarian regime. It was <clears throat> the choice between soft power and hard power and it was made in favor of uh, hard power. Uh, it was uh, uh, the choice between uh, the West and uh, the East, and it was made in favor of the East. And there is nothing uh, which uh, authorities can make now, even if changing their mind. And uh, what is uh, important, uh, I think, it's not only further, uh, further weakening of political institutions, it's making the society uh, coming back uh, to the state uh, where it used to be 20 years ago. This idealistic picture that there is good society and bad government in Russia is not uh, right uh, and society is now as bad as it used to be 20 years ago. So these 20 years which were used in order to civilize society to make it uh, more uh, well, European uh, type uh, to develop uh, rule of law, uh, uh, they were uh, lost. And uh, if only, and uh, if to imagine that the country is coming back to the uh, path it uh, used to develop by uh, until recently, it will take another 20 years to, to restore all these uh, 
uh, result which has been ruined in uh, terms of the society. Regime is transforming and is transforming in a very fast way and uh, uh, we can say that it's now different from what it used to be even several months ago. I will just mention several directions of this transformation. One is weakening of institutions which used to be weak but they became even weaker. Uh, another one is uh, creation of police state and there are very different elements uh, uh, how Russia is becoming more and more a kind of police state. Then there is nationalization of elites, making elites much more dependent from the Kremlin and uh, personal uh, uh, cleansings, uh, purges, which are soft now, but uh, which will become uh, not that soft in recent future. Then there is expansion of the state in different spheres of uh, uh, societal life and uh, personal life. There is uh, uh, the end, <coughs> the final deconstruction of foolproof uh, mechanisms which used uh, to keep uh, the state uh, within certain limits. Uh, there is a sharp increase of control over information uh, space and uh, liquidation of any uh, islands of uh, relative autonomy. There is very serious weakening of judiciary. And well, you can understand that uh, along these lines, uh, the state is uh, developing in a very uh, dangerous uh, direction. Uh, the key point is legitimacy, just uh, as uh, 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 Konstantin uh, put it, and uh, the problem is that Putin switched to a very different kind of legitimacy. No more this is democratic legitimacy which should be kept by means of elections. This is military legitimacy and the only way to keep this legitimacy is either to uh, find other rabbits uh, and, the Crimea, and Crimea is unique, so there is no way for Putin to find any other gifts like this. The second uh, uh, possibility is to create the image of enemies uh, from outside, uh, which uh, uh, should uh, promote consolidation of elites and consolidation of the nation around the uh, military leader. And the third element which is inevitable is to construct repression mechanism in order to keep in power uh, if and when legitimacy will go down. And this repression mechanism, we can see some elements of this mechanism which are already in place and uh, it should work in direction of both elites and uh, ordinary Russians. So I would say that annexation of Crimea, in my view, uh, meant uh, the choice made uh, in favor of constructing full-scale authoritarian, uh, authoritarian state in Russia, and Putin doesn't have any other choice. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, regime is now hostage of Putin and his popularity, and the state and ourselves are hostages of uh, this uh, uh, regime, which lost the opportunity of any other kind of uh, evolution. Uh, we do have international team which is working on scenarios for the future and we did consider different options including, including uh, evolution of the regime in a positive direction. This option is closed and until Putin is in power there is no way for uh, Russia and for Russian political regime to uh, to come back to uh, that option. So direction is defined and it's defined till the very end of this regime and perhaps creation of uh, uh, another one. Uh, I did mention uh, very negative developments in Russian society and well, uh, sociological polls do clear uh, illustrate this point. We did have 28% uh, of uh, <coughs> Those uh, who did support uh, Alexei Navalny, the uh, leader of uh, the opposition in last year uh, mayoral elections in Moscow. 
now the share, the number of Muscovites who do not support taking Crimea is only 7%. So there used to be 28%, now there is 7%. Not only this is transformation of, uh, well, uh, liberals into mm. statists, uh, but it shows that opposition uh, to Putin and to the regime is not very homogenous and it did consist uh, of uh, right-wing opposition, of nationalist opposition, as well as of uh, liberal opposition. So the share of liberal opposition is not that big and this is another uh, uh, very negative uh, element which means that if Putin is out, uh, the regime which will uh, follow uh, can be not necessarily and I would say less probably democratic regime and more uh, probably uh, nationalistic uh, rightist uh, regime. So uh, the gap uh, between, well, you know, in Russia there is uh, 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 well, expression that uh, the government uh, is much more European than uh, the nation. Now the gap between the government and the nation is uh, closer and unfortunately the next government, although this one is very bad, but the next one can be even, uh, even worse. And uh, to end on positive note, <laughs> I would good. say, <laughs> good. We've been waiting for that. Uh, that, in my view, the country moves uh, in 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 a very wrong direction uh, into the dead end. There is no way uh, to wait that this regime will change this trajectory. And the only positive thing is that uh, the crisis did. Uh, make uh, development very fast. So political development is now much faster than it used to be, meaning that the end uh, of the movement in this wrong direction uh, and the collapse of uh, the regime will take place much faster than it could be in case if uh, those events of last three months would not happen. So uh, uh, I did start with saying that we do have this international team. Now we are uh, working out the uh, report Russia after 2014, and we do have uh, we do have uh, well alarmists and uh, more calm experts, including Natalia. Macroeconomists are saying that economy, there is nothing bad, and uh, economic position of Russia is much better than of any uh, other uh, uh, country and it means that uh, the regime can uh, survive for several years without any changes. There is no need to change populist politics, there is no need to reshape any uh, well, uh, position of the regime with regard to this or that problem due to this financial well-being. And there is another group of uh, Optimists, I would say, uh, including myself, who are saying that regime will die not due to lack of financial resources, but due to this very fast and very negative political development. Before it will die, it will make a lot of troubles uh, to all of us, not only within the country, but uh, outside the country. But uh, uh, it's moving very fast in this, uh, uh, in this uh, dead end, uh, so we can, uh, if, if only I, I would be uh, able to sleep for, say, two years, uh, I'm pretty much sure that in two years from now the situation will be absolutely different from what it is now. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Nikolai. So if I understood correctly, the positive news was that the situation in Russia is getting worse much faster. Right. <laughs> so I, I'm not really sure about that, but yeah. yeah. Uh, and of course there is this big question that is looming behind and that is a very Russian question. What is to be done both internally and also what is to be done externally? That is, what actions should we take? Because if, if there is this... Uh, a very substantial threat that the, the next government or the next 
ruling class might be even even more anti-European, even more xenophobic, and so on. Then the question is, what 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 consequences does it have on our policy? Does it perhaps even, and I try to be provocative here, translate into a kind of support for this regime uh, by the West? And that's of course a very very tricky question. Uh, but we still have two speakers. Just for your information, we'll have the two presentations. Then we'll make a short break because this panel is really long, and of course we need to refresh our results. And then we'll come back for 45 minutes of discussion after the short break. So, but first, uh, Alexander and then Natalia. Alexander. Mm -hmm. After this break. No, 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 now, no. now. Uh, thank you for invitation, uh, uh, and uh, I have. Not so many uh, notes uh, on these big uh, uh, issues. Uh, I'm a journalist, and uh, for me, very interesting uh, is, uh, some uh, uh, changes in uh, domestic policy in Russia. Uh, at first, I say that um, uh, we see the new situation with the propaganda, and uh, for me, it's very uh, important that it is not. Uh, uh, the, the aims of Putin's uh, policy is not the uh, uh, is not the only propaganda, but the um, uh, um, so-called um, anthropological experiments uh, under the society to the direction uh, of the self-censored society. Mm. Uh, it is uh, uh, it is uh, the uh, challenge for. Uh, Russian journalists uh, uh, and, uh, community and for the all uh, society. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, when we can uh, can uh, do th uh, with that new situation. Self-censored uh, society. It is the uh, very very difficult problem for uh, for the perspective. Uh, and the second, uh, um, my second uh, note. Uh, about the um, uh, political space uh, in Russia. The uh, news um, is that we don't have the uh, political center uh, in classical sense. Uh, after the uh, two last year, uh, the marginals uh, from uh, uh, left or right sides uh, go to the center of a political sphere in Russia, and now the um, uh, so uh, such uh, such men uh, as Prokhanov, Limonov, uh, and uh, uh, many others, uh, very strange, uh, very strange uh, uh, ideologies. Uh, we see not uh, on the um, uh, left, right, or the um, peripheries, but in the center. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, this situation uh, don't um, don't be um, uh, uh, don't continue, continue very very um, uh, in Russian долго uh, because it is the uh, high level of um, aggressive uh, emotions uh, and it's very interesting question what we see uh, after the one year or two year with the political center in Russia. And uh, uh, for me and for uh, my communication uh, in the last uh, two or three, man, uh, three, year, three months uh, in, in Europe, uh, it is very important uh, such, uh, uh, such um, uh, impression. Putin now uh, not only the problem of um, uh, domestic policy in Russia. I see that Putin uh, became the problem of uh, European problem. It is it is a new situation because um, year ago, uh, five year, uh, years ago, we see that in Europe uh, uh, support uh, uh, supporters uh, Putin supporters. Uh, it was the only specifically man who uh, uh, have uh, money from Kremlin, or it is the uh, specifically man who, um, uh, in European uh, political uh, sphere, uh, uh, 
ultra left and ultra right, uh, 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 right. Uh, and now we see uh, that in Europe we see the new situation. We see the um, non-political people who, um, uh, in, uh, in Germany, uh, so-called Putin versteers. It is it is interesting situation, and I think that it is uh, important for a Russian uh, domestic policy. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, in last, I uh, want to say about uh, the situation uh, about European uh, European direction to European direction to the support civil society in Russia. It is it is a paradox that. Um, uh, 25, 25 years European citizens, uh, foundation, foundations, universities, uh, non-government non, non organizations uh, n uh, support a Russian uh, civil, civil societies with many, many programs, uh, uh, many, um, uh, many conferences, many uh, uh, cultural uh, forms of uh, kind of cultural exchanges. And I think that uh, it is the big fiasco, because if now in Russia more than 80% uh, percent, uh, percent, uh, percent people support the aggressive uh, and uh, neo-imperialistic uh, policy of Putin, uh, European, uh, European, um, uh, European uh, leaders and uh, we in Russia too, we, the liberal journalists and uh, the uh, liberal uh, politics must say uh, for himself we have the uh, we have the fiasco uh, and we don't um, don't uh, don't um, do uh, uh, don't um, uh, come to the future with the uh, old strategies. Uh, we need the new strategies to the future. Uh, common, common for common for common uh, activities, uh, common European Russians, uh, journalists, uh, uh, political uh, activists, and uh, so on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So thank you for the for some of the concrete proposals, and again, I th I think we'll come back to those mm -hmm. afterwards. So now the last speaker is Natalia, who prepared a presentation as well. So please turn your attention also to the screen in front. Okay, I know. Thank you. And this one, for yeah. Okay. No, is it is it turned off? Ah, this one. Yes, turned off. Okay. No. Red sun. Red sun. No. Nothing. Isn't it too far? Too far. Okay. Okay. No. No. It did something. I may I may sit there. It's, it's easier okay. if you allow me to sit there near my oh, computer. Works. It's working. It's working. Uh -huh. Thank you very much for the invitation. Being uh, 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 being a woman, I'm not so excited. I try to keep cold my head, and uh, it's a first idea. And secondly. I count figures. It's a big difference uh, with, uh, between a political analysis, uh, which is emotional, historically oriented, a lot of comparisons, and those who count figures. Uh, I'll try give very short explanation of what's, what is happening because we had a special economic session. Uh, very briefly. Point one, answering your questions. Political or economical motivation? <laughs> Absolutely clear answer. Mm. Political benefits mm. and economic costs. And